Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. So today we have uh, Captain Don Walsh of the United States Navy. Uh, he spent a great deal of time as a commander of submarines. He was the Dean of Marine Programs and Professor of Engineering at the University of Southern California, amongst many, many other roles. I think he's probably been awarded every honour there is to be awarded, and he's still very much in support of ocean sciences, especially in his work on the Ocean Sciences Board at the National Academy of Science. But of course, he's mostly known for his part in the first descent to the deepest place on the planet, the, the Challenger Deep, which he did with Jack Picard in 1960. He more recently joined the James Cameron expedition for the Deep Sea Challenge uh, and the Five Deeps expedition last year. So uh, despite reaching legendary status, what I personally like about Don the most is that he has no ego whatsoever. So Don joins us from his house in Oregon. So hello, Don. Hello to you. First question, Don, was I remember that day that you, me and Rob McCallum did the world tour of every local radio station in Guam. And I remember you saying, it's been 60 years and people keep asking me the same questions. And those questions were, was it dangerous and were you scared? To which you replied, I would never have done any of this if I was scared or if it was dangerous. So my question to you is, regarding the, the big challenge of deep dive, what is the question that you would like people to ask you? You know, people, and I understand that, they, they want to know, because it is well out of their realm of experience, and it was of mine at the time. Were you scared? So I do my best to explain it. And uh, the other, how deep what did you go and what did you see? Those are kind of the, the trilogy of most important questions. But if I were to ask, I'd just say, why? Because uh, it's so out of line with common everyday experience. I, mean, I think all of us understand the, the why of space and why that's important. Of course, in my view, space is a program where the oceans are a place. Somehow we have to understand the, the place where we live and how it works and what effect we're having on it. All big, weighty questions. And so that all comes into the why. And, and the why is knowledge to know. Because without knowledge, it's pretty hard to govern, understand, or exploit anything. Although we've never let that get in the way of making a lot of mistakes. Uh, you know, I always thought that in addition to missions to the moon and Mars, that there ought to be a nice mission to planet Earth. But the budgets for ocean studies are certainly nowhere near the sums that have been allocated to uh, space work. And, and they're both big science. You have to have a lot of kit, uh, a lot of uh, money to pay for the operations and so on. But the ocean is the same way. I mean, you can't do it on the cheap. You just can't go out with a small boat and a dog and do great science. You have to have ships. You have to have uh, shore side laboratories. Uh, and, and we're just not doing that. I'm not against space. But I am for parity with ocean studies. It's very nice to go to the moon and colonize Mars and all of that, but we basically don't understand the largest geographic feature on our planet. And I would think that would be very troublesome to most people. I completely agree. And the question of why is something that comes up a lot, for me at least as well. And it's one of those ones where I think, again, as, as humans' relationship with water is weird. If you turned the Mariana Trench, for example, upside down and made a mountain, and people only went, let's say, 10% up the mountain. The question you would ask is, why don't, why don't you go to the top? It wouldn't be, why did you go to the top? It'd be, why didn't you? But because it's underwater, it's almost strange that it's the, it's the why, did you, why did you go all the way, as opposed to, why are you not going all the way? Okay. I've always felt that when you know, people have been asking me for years, you know, why do you spend all your time looking at the bits of the planet which are so far removed from humans? The ocean doesn't understand these imaginary lines that are drawn that says... Something on this planet thinks this is shallow and this is deep, therefore this is important and this isn't. It's just one big body of water and it just moves around the planet as one. So we should understand all of it. I, I get asked that a lot too. Why haven't we been going down there more? I just give them back the numbers. If you can get to 6,000 meters, you can roughly look at 98% of the seafloor of the world ocean. Yeah. So for having the engineering and operational and, let's say, budgetary ability to go somewhat more than half the full ocean depth, that is 6,000 meters against 11,000 meters, uh, and get 
That, that's what we call cost-benefit ratio is very high. That's why we see today, I think, half dozen or five to six manned submersibles, for example, and, and probably not many more than that of unmanned submersibles that can achieve 6,000 meters all clustered around that depth. But only one is capable of full ocean depth uh, and doing it repeatedly, and that's uh, Victor Vescovo's uh, very elegant system. And I think I like to stress the point that it's a system, not just the submersible, it's the mothership equipped with that marvelous bottom mapping acoustic machines and the three unmanned landers and the sub. They all work together as a system. I've been saying for years, probably the world needed at least one system of this sort that could go everywhere. And I'm thinking of the model of the deep sea drilling project where you have this one drill ship that happens to be owned by the United States, but uh, it takes scientists from all nations who qualify and have the budget to do uh, their scientific work. Everybody doesn't have to have their own. That's, you know, where do you raise the flag kind of thing. And that doesn't do us much good in, in, in uh, studying the world ocean because there's no one nation that has all of the marbles, all the capabilities, all of the talent. It's so important for international coordination and cooperation. And we seem to have that a bit in the space program, but it's a high-ticket item. You, you have to buy in, and it costs a lot of money. The next thing I wanted to ask you was, you will be aware that next month we're going to see the first paying tourists descending to Challenger Deep. Now, I have kind of slightly mixed feelings about that. I think it would be, I guess, arrogant to think that the, the Challenger Deep should be an ex- exclusively science club. But then at the same time, it would be sad to see it become a bit like Everest, where there's just lots of people, you know, rocketing up and down, paying big top dollar to, to go there. But at the same time, it, in the current funding climate, it, it seems that high-end extreme tourism if that model could then punt money back into the science, then maybe there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, what are your thoughts about opening up Challenger Deep as a tourist attraction? I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the purists among us, and you know them and I know them, think that it's beneath us to uh, let the unwashed into what we do, and God forbid that they could participate. And, and you know from the history of oceanography, because it largely began in the U.K., you know, in the 18th, well, actually 19th century, a lot of it came through citizen scientists now. But these were people who were just curious. They wanted to know about things. You had these naturalist societies in England that, uh, you know, walk along the seashore and collect critters and play them. And then the people started having aquaria in their homes. So uh, this vast, mysterious place was a place of enormous curiosity and attraction. But a lot of that came from frankly, more well-to-do people who could invest in modest activities along in the coastal oceans. And we know before World War II that private philanthropy was a major supporter and encourager, if you will, of ocean exploration. Great example is Prince Albert I, who at the end of the 19th century, here you've got a chief of state, Monaco, uh, investing his personal fortune and his time in doing genuine ocean exploration. It was a real deal. It wasn't some gentleman uh, floor. He was out there with his, uh, two of his royal yachts, and he used them shamelessly to do ocean research. One of the first seafloor charts ever made was the result of his efforts and participation. Places in Svalbard named after him and so on. You know, when he spoke about the importance of the ocean, people listened, because here's a, a man in charge of a country, a prince, and he's all in. And he was very effective up to about 1910. And, uh, you know, built that wonderful oceanographic museum in Monaco. And so you had that kind of thing. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the United States in 1930. That was primarily Rockefeller money that helped mm-hmm. pick it. Scripps Institution. That was the Scripps uh, newspaper empire. Apparently, some of the family was living in the San Diego, La Jolla area and thought it'd be nice to establish a marine station. That was 1903, I believe, or 1908, around there, that the first building was put up. Uh, Most of that money was from Scripps. So that is nothing new. We see it today with others who are putting a lot of money into uh, ocean studies. We do have an increasing group of very wealthy philanthropists who not only want to help support this, they want to participate. It puts a supplement on top of what uh, government sums are willing to pay for. There's many hands reaching for the money, and you've got to make your case. And I don't think we've done that well in the oceanographic community. Uh, A lot of marine scientists don't like to get involved with the uh, mere mortals. I'm too busy, and I haven't got time to educate you on what I do. When I get finished with my work, I'll tell you the import of it and how the information I've developed as a scientist can be used. 
for the benefit of humankind. But at the time I'm doing it, I haven't got time to explain to you. Well, you do that at your peril. NASA does a superb job uh, of explaining what they do to the public. Just go on the NASA website. And yeah. a wonderful website, images taken from the spacecraft. That's all for public education. But it's that public that votes for the members of parliament or the members of Congress who then provide the sums. If they don't understand what we're doing, guess what? We're not going to get those sums. And so we're, we're not getting the kind of budgets we need, and not just in the United States or UK, but throughout the world. The story is not being told. That's why I think the marriage of the uh, explorer and the storyteller is so important. Storytellers provide that kind of translation between the worker and the general public. And if you don't make the case for why what you're doing is important, then guess what? You're not going to get the money. Frankly, we're not selling what we do to the public, and the public not knowing what we do is not very supportive. How can you support something you don't know? I think you're dead right. I think one of the things bugging me at the moment, and this it may be a subject of many of these podcasts, is when you look at the example you gave there of NASA, when, when they have to explain their science, they explain it very well and they're very articulate. The lay person has under no illusion that that's what they do. They do science, they do great work, they experiment, they explore. But then at the same time, whenever you switch on the TV and there's something to do with deep sea, that science yeah. is lost. It just becomes super dark, evil, weird monsters, creatures of the deep and so on. And, and a descent in a submarine becomes dangerous, becomes scary, becomes darkness. You know, it just becomes a science fiction story rather than being a, a legitimate story of science and exploration on a par with space exploration. So there's something weird about that transition from other sciences to marine and certainly to deep sea science. You know, the big TV shows like, you know, Blue Planet 2 and stuff, I mean, it's still doing the same thing. It's still presenting the deep sea like a Victorian freak show. It's a cultural thing that's going to have to change if it's going to get taken seriously. Also, the storytellers, scientists who are also uh, very articulate storytellers, don't have an easy time. Uh, Carl Sagan, who was, you know, in his own right, uh, was a brilliant astronomer, but he was a very, very good communicator. He had a huge success in his TV series explaining space to people. In his own community, they say, well, he ought to be at the workbench, not at the microphone. And, and, and people poop to uh, Jacques Cousteau. He was a popularizer of science. When I was at university back in the uh, late 70s, I can't tell you how many young people would come to my office and talk about how they wanted to be a marine biologist, just like Jacques Cousteau. Uh, so many of them couldn't find work because they didn't realize that it was only one of the many disciplines involved in studying the oceans. Uh, but uh, it became a, uh, a definition of oceanographer that you were a biologist. And so we weren't getting marine geologists and physical oceanographers, chemical oceanographers, and the other areas because uh, they weren't mentioned. But Cousteau caught a lot of heat for him being the showman. And he was a showman, no question about it. He knew how to popularize uh, exploration of the oceans, the ocean science, and, and he, you know, he took some licenses with how he set up his programs, but it was always for, uh, for the effect, the fay, as they say, in making it really interesting, entertaining, but also there was a message buried in there. And I knew him. I first met him in 62, and I, I did a couple of little programs on board Calypso, but it was nothing big. It was just alongside a dock and school children in, in, uh, in Toulon. But uh, he had the knack, and he knew how to tell the story, and he did it well. But if you listen to his musings about the importance of the ocean, that's waxing on very philosophical. You know, he was passionate. There was no doubt about that. The science community didn't respect him. They used him and trying to get him to promote their, their programs. But a lot of, there was not a lot of respect there. There's a lot of respect by the, you know, the public uh, at large. We can see that from all the awards and honors he got. But uh, the storytellers, it's a sporty course especially if you are a scientist trying to explain things uh, to people. That's why Sir David Attenborough is doing such a great job. I mean, he's just born to the calling, wasn't he? And he's, there's not a lot of those people around. We ought to encourage and grow them. We need the storytellers, especially if you're not particularly gifted in that area or don't want to allocate your time. It's terribly time-consuming. It takes a lot of will and, and, and discipline to do both. There's a kind of middle ground there as well, because, you know, at, at university, when I teach at undergrad yeah. level, there's been quite a few times where students have said to me, you know, they just want to do the field work or the practical work. 
Uh, they're not, you know, they don't think that standing up and talking about it is really their thing. And, and there was a couple of years ago, I remember I had a student who said, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm no good at writing. I'm not bothered about writing. I'm just not good at that. And I had to say to her, you, you could have done the best experiment the world has ever seen or made the biggest discovery the world has ever known. But if you can't communicate that to a single other person effectively, then it was it was for nothing. It's not like I don't like writing, therefore I'm not going to write, or I don't like talking in public, so I'm not going to do it. It's a fundamental part of science, is getting that information from your head into somebody else's. That's what science is, right? You know, the, the story of the 1960 Challenger Deep Dive, everyone knows yourself, and hopefully everyone's also heard, heard of, of the car as well, but it takes a lot of people to do something like that. It's more than two guys in a submarine. So my question for you is, is there anyone else who was involved in that dive that you felt never quite got the recognition they deserve? Yeah, uh, that's a, a very thoughtful question. Uh, there are a whole bunch of people who uh, took a chance on us, uh, even though we're just a small group of 14 people. Uh, we, you know, we had an army of uh, supporters that weren't in the same room at all time. Uh, one person that jumps out is uh, our chief scientist, and that was uh, Dr. Andy Recknitzer. Uh, he was a freshly minted uh, PhD out of Scripps, marine biologist, ended up going to Capri when uh, our Office of Naval Research rented the Trieste for a summer to do sample test dives. Picards had offered the, the bathyscaphe to the U.S. Navy as a, a deep diving research platform, take yep. the trained mind and the trained eyes inside the ocean at any depth. This is kind of a very novel concept because there are only two of these things in the world at the time. The French Navy had one and Picards had the other, the Trieste. And so what our Navy did, the Office of Naval Research, they actually leased it for a summer, and Jacques Picard did a series of, I think, 14, 17 dives at Capri. And what you had on board were a, an assortment of U.S. marine scientists. You had an acoustics guy, a biologist, a geologist, and so on. The question then was, all right, you have tested this, that you've used it. How does it look through the lens of your particular discipline could you use a platform like this? Would this be useful in your work? Hmm. And so at the end of that summer series in Capri, the group agreed, yes, this, I, this has promise as a new type of scientific platform, allow us to do things we could never do before. And Andy Recknitzer was one of those scientists. And so he made one of the early dives at Capri. He was employed by the U.S. Navy at the time. And so he went back to the Navy lab in San Diego and said, you know, this is an amazing device. We've got deep water offshore here in San Diego, and so it ought to come here. And lo and behold, the Navy agreed. Andy was behind all of that. He set up the program, got the facility pretty much in hand by the time I joined the program in January of, of 1959. So Andy is undervalued and underappreciated and not mentioned in the accounts like he should be. I'm going to have to look him up now. Please do. Amazing guy. He, he was my mentor, really. I mean, when I came into the program, it was up and running. I, I joined the program in January 59. In January 60, I'm on the bottom of the ocean in the deepest place. Uh, even though I was a submarine officer, you know, I've been underwater a lot. The submarines I was serving on could go all the way to 300 feet. So to go from 300 feet to 35,800 feet in, uh, in 14 months was an awesome experience. In the late 50s, uh, early 50s, I should say, he started using scuba. He was one of the first ocean scientists to go inside the ocean and make direct observations. So he was one of the very first. And when he got a sample dive at Capri in the bathyscaphe to uh, 1,000 meters, that was a game changer for him, and he became a convert. He was supposed to make the deep dive. I wasn't supposed to go. Uh, well, I was supposed to be the pilot, and he was going to be the scientist, but uh, what happened was we did realize that Jacques Picard had a contract with the Office of Naval Research that he would make all uh, such dives. And that was only revealed to us just before we were to make the deep dive. So Andy had to drop out. I volunteered to drop out in favor of Andy because he's much better qualified than I was, to say the least. He was a commander in the Naval Reserve, so he could have been put on active duty, put on a uniform. And you'd have a naval officer on board and a scientist, but the powers that be wouldn't go along with that. So I just kind of backed into it. Wow, that's brilliant. What a fascinating story. One very last question for you. What's the best party you've ever been to? The best party? Oh, boy. The best parties are when you're with your mates. In the submarine service, which is close-knit, elite group, 
You don't really talk much about what you're doing because what you're doing is so hazardous. Not inherently hazardous, but where you operate can be very hazardous. You don't want people to know what you're doing, where you're going. We just disappear for a couple of months at a time. We couldn't tell our families or anything where we're going or what we were doing. And to this day, uh, still a lot of it remains highly classified. And so we were welded together. And then also inside a submarine, there's no room to uh, differentiate people by rank. It's more like a large family uh, between the officers and the enlisted. Mutual respect because there was no distance between you like in a more hierarchical organization. We, We didn't have any of that. It was a different feeling and a lot of collegial respect and uh, and affection for your people. So when we had submarine parties, we played hard and we worked hard. So those were fun because we get together with people that, you know, have similar experience, similar stresses in their lives. The fact is that there wasn't a lot of that in submarines. And if you didn't fit in, then uh, you could either quit on your own without penalty or you get fired. It was one of the few military organizations that if somebody didn't fit in uh, at the command level, uh, you could just fire them. They get redeployed. And that's why those parties were especially great. Some of our best ones have been port calls in some random place after some great discovery with a small band of thieves. And interesting today, we, we, we uh, spoke to somebody else. What was the what was best party you've ever been to? And they said it was uh, on Capri, which is exactly where you've just been talking about. Well, that that's uh, very apt because you mentioned Capri. That's kind of what got me dedicated to coming into the world of oceanography. I said, these guys go to neat places and do good works. You know, I was already a lifetime sailor. I was a career naval officer. I said, I want to be an oceanographer. And I had a nice apprenticeship in the Trieste because every dive I made, I had usually have a different scientist. I'd have, you know, next week a geologist, the week before I had a biologist. And just two of you in the, in the Bathurst camp, the Trieste. Yeah. So you had to understand what he wanted to do. And uh, I'll give you an example, Carl Hubbs, one of the great ichthyologists in history. Uh, he could name everything. But I got him uh, down, and he looked out the window. He said, well, Professor Hubbs, what do you see? He said, fish. I kind of figured that. And I, just, <laughs> I said, well, what kind? Because I had the open mic. I'm, I'm coaching him to talk to the tape recorder. And he said, lots of fish. I said, well, you got more for me? And, and so that's kind of coaching we did, uh, I did as the pilot. So it was an apprenticeship. I, I learned the words, uh, something about what these people do, and a variety of them, many disciplines. But I didn't have the formal book training. So at one point in my career, I got the Navy to give me the time off to go back to university and get a proper graduate-level education. I wanted to study acoustics because you know internal waves are kind of important in operating submarines because it changes the quality of sound in the sea. And so I wanted to study hydrodynamics of the ocean in graduate school because I figured that'd make me a better uh, submarine driver because my next job after graduate school was command of a submarine. And the oceanographer of the Navy came down to uh, Texas A&M where I was in school and said that he had been to a very interesting meeting with NASA and NASA wanted to know what could you tell about the world ocean from Earth orbiting platforms. And I said, well, that's certainly very interesting, Admiral. I'll make sure I keep up with the literature and find out how you do that. I said it to the Admiral, and he said, well, Commander Walsh, I want you to uh, go down to NASA Houston and find out what they're doing. I said, well, I'd like that. I'll go down, and I'll write your report. He said, no, I want you to be in it. I said, I'm not wearing wings, Admiral. I'm wearing submarine dolphins, and I'm interested in underwater acoustics. He said, Commander, I don't think you hear what I'm saying. And I said, yes, sir, Admiral, I can hear loud and clear now, Admiral. And so for three and a half years, I rode around the back of NASA airplanes as much as I did on research ships and became, I think, one of the first half dozen or so oceanographers in the United States to work in remote sensing oceanography. And this is the wow. mid-1960s. So I thought, well, this is pretty neat. Wouldn't it be great to get out there and look back at the ocean as one total entity? So that's why I went on for my doctorate, so I could become an astronaut. But my eyes weren't good enough to be in in the Apollo program because everybody had to be a rated military aviator, and I couldn't qualify for uh, flight training. So I gave up on that. And then years later, I found out that the Navy was going to nominate me for the first oceanographer in the shuttle program. Sadly, I've been retired for a while, and I was at a university, so uh, that door slammed shut behind me. I don't know where I'm going with all of this. I don't know. It's fascinating (laughs) just listening to it. 
I drank at the well of many different areas of ocean activities, bottom of the ocean, submarine service, working on surface ships uh, with the MIR subs, and, and then uh, even the space program. Well, and of course, uh, the underlying theme of uh, working in the Arctic, uh, polar regions a lot. I've been working actually in the polar regions longer than I had worked uh, under sea. My first Arctic trip was 70 years ago, and my first Antarctic trip was about 55 years ago. I've gone about 80 polar expeditions, and I've got the Walsh Spur named after me in the Antarctic. So, I, I, you know, it wasn't just visiting, I was doing. But when we're talking about stuff like we're talking about today, uh, I don't usually bring this up because it doesn't relate to uh, studying the ocean. That is, is, honestly, it Donna, this has been one of the most fascinating things, just sitting and listening to all this. is incredible. Have you ever written all this down? I'm writing a, uh, a, a what I call an unauthorized autobiography. It's called Sea Stories, and it's S-E-E, Sea Stories, Conversations with Myself. It, I, I call it a bathroom book because most of them are 800 or 1,000 words, so you're sitting on the thunder mug, just read one of these things, you know, have done with it. You haven't lost the thread of the, the storyline. I don't know how to do a conventional book, so I'm, I'm writing up these little anecdotes. One of your countrymen, Arthur C. Clarke, the science writer, well, yep. he was my dive buddy in Salon. Because, <laughs> and nobody believed it, except I have a picture of Arthur and myself and our kit. So, But he gave me a tour of the heavens. We were in Trincomalee. He brought along his Celestron telescope. And because we were in the big naval base there at Trincomalee, which was where Mountbatten had his headquarters during World War II. But when the Senegalese Navy had it, they had two uh, 40-foot Vosper patrol boats and, and a couple of dogs. So at 4 o'clock every day, they'd lock the gate and turn off the lights. And so we were there in the dark, so we couldn't see anything. So he brought along this telescope, and we'd set it up outside in pure darkness. He'd give me a tour of the heavens. I thought that was a pretty good guide. So it's experiences like that, lots and lots of them. And uh, how I helped the Shah of Iran uh, abdicate, that's another good one. You know, I think I did. I'm not sure. I can't and, wait uh, to read it. It's amazing. You heard it here first. Don Walsh is writing his unauthorized autobiography, which I think is going to be an absolutely amazing read. Well, what's more important, Alan, in all of this is the journey, not the destination, because we all know what that is. And at the age of 88, I can see the off-ramp from here. But uh, as having a good run, I think the worst sin, although it's not in the list of the cardinal sins, is boredom. I agree. And I define, by the way, we talked about exploration earlier, I've defined it for years as curiosity acted upon. I was glad to have John Glenn even repeat that, and Jim Cameron uses it a lot. But mm. we're all curious about things we see, and that lasts for about eight microseconds, then we go on to something else. You say, well, I wonder how that works. Why is that? Did you notice this? And you don't act on it. But if you act on it, then you're an explorer. A baby in its mother's arms is exploring. It's looking all around its new world. And when it becomes mobile, it's running around the restaurant, picking the gum off the bottom of the table. It's in the mid-teen years when the hormones and peer pressure and everything, it kind of beats it out of you. And, and not that many of us maintain it into adulthood. And that's, that's sad. So um, exploration, curiosity, acted upon. If you act upon something that interests you, that you're curious about, now you're an explorer. Thanks very much, Don. That was absolutely magic. It's interesting to hear what Don was saying about science communication. I didn't know that Cousteau got a better grief off other scientists. That's, that's, I thought that was quite interesting, but I can kind of see why, because there is a sort of hardcore science community that don't necessarily engage with outreach, and then there's opposite end with there's people who engage in a lot of outreach that don't necessarily do a lot of science, but they're both as valuable. I think I was trying to say that during that interview was, you know, you can be the best scientist in the world, but if you can't communicate it to someone else, it doesn't mean anything. And that concludes this pressurised version of the Deep Sea Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to go into some more detail, you can find the full episode in the feed. Just match the episode numbers. We'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company, Amatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can provide the technology and know-how to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience through storytelling, fact-checking, or presentations, we can help with that as well. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone.